<clears throat> this is update for March uh, 12 and 11, 2023, days 382 of the war and of the date of date. So I'm going to uh, talk today about the strategic uh, events that are happening and then we're going to switch to um, frontline situation in Ukraine. Uh, first, I want to mention a couple things uh, about China. So uh, the most important is that uh, there are a lot of appointments happening after this, um, I don't know how you call it, it's not really parliament in China, but this um, meeting of all of this uh, Communist Party bureaucrats uh, that are nominally elected, but really not elected. Um, and so there are um, there are a lot of appointments happening uh, now in China. They are being well. They they happened and now being released and announced to public. Um, for the most part, as I said before, um, Chinese president, you know, as I said, got re uh, uh, approved by the broader sort of um, communist bureaucratic system. Uh, and for the most part he got his people but are still um um old sort of um bureaucrats uh from the um from the pro-trade faction um they're still there some of them they are not in the most important positions and over a year or so he will get rid of out of all of them because then they appointed but then they can be replaced they can be removed they they can be dismissed by him later so this is uh, so he will need to do sort of final clean up and sweep over i don't know you know i'm not uh you know part of the chinese uh bureaucratic system but probably at most a year and he's gonna clean up uh most of these people leftovers let's put this way um among the people who were uh, announced as appointment is new minister of defense uh, of china and the most interesting part about him obviously he's extremely loyal to the chinese president his person uh the most imp interesting though part is that uh he is sanctioned by the us since 2018 basically what this means he's not allowed to to go to the US, he's not allowed to have any, uh, you know, financial dealings and nothing basically with the US. So you can imagine the person is probably quite aggressively anti US, um, and you would have that kind of person um, not when you would like to have a peace, let's put it this way. Uh, his background is uh, aerospace, specifically more space part of it. Uh, he worked on a, a Chinese program to shoot to sh uh, shut down uh, uh, satellites. So they did tests, uh, successfully shut down satellite there. Um, so for those who don't know much, uh, China has uh, extremely large fleet of satellites right now in the space. They are launching a lot. They I don't know, didn't remember statistics, but I believe I'm not if I'm not wrong that they have more satellites than the U.S. So um, they build up huge fleet of satellites up there in a, in a space, and they also uh, would like to extend f warfare into the space and basically pr practicing how to shut down enemy satellites, which is going to be extremely important for the warfare because. All navigation, um, intelligence, everything really depends on satellites. They are extremely critical military asset. And if you remove that from your enemy or hinder ability, you really um, almost like a half of the victory, basically, uh, or if not more, but definitely at least half. So and what he did was extremely important. So he, this is. As you can see, this is not the appointment of someone who just, um, you know, was, let's put it this way, low intelligence, low capabilities. As someone who was really uh, spearheading Chinese uh, satellite program, military satellite program, I would say 
on surface almost again i don't you know they have all of the details about the chinese satellite program but on surface uh, he uh, seems to be successful uh also not only that but also you know made this advances in terms of learning how to shut down enemy satellites and so on so this is someone you know this is kind of the uh, type of person you would like to have when you would like to have a military conflict sort of this looks like on the surface high quality person let's put this way um now let's uh, talk a little bit uh, about uh, China and it's gaining influence in the Persian Gulf. So I mentioned about the China brokering peace between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran and probably looks like they would, wasn't really brokering. They have enough leverage over Iran to force Iran to do what China needs. And that's really the essence of the deal. And they need Saudi Arabia on at least neutral um uh in the future war so or, or let's say persian gulf countries to be neutral and not supporting of the us uh and sort of kind of like have a leverage against europe because now europe is getting more and more of let's say crude oil from uh persian gulf well some of it is obviously russian but still mm, they trying to switch to persian gulf because the U.S. does not have enough crude oil to supply Europe. It has a, enough natural gas to supply uh, Europe, which is what it is doing. That helps Europe to sort of survive, but not sort of do well. It's definitely not a solution. It's a band-aid so far. Uh, how it's going to be resolved remains to be seen. Mm, but anyways, um, China gains leverage in a key region, key supplier of energy. So in case of the war, they can basically try to shut down supply of energy to Europe and and, US, and basically create a difficult situation for the US. Sh uh, acute shortages, let's put this way, and probably will create that for, let's say, Japan uh, and South Korea. At least in the region, they will be really controlling situation. Um, they're also building, building out um, um navy capabilities the there's a lot of reports that they building this uh frigates like a you know like a um like a sausage so because they accumulated uh essentially they i think they control about 50 percent of the uh, world um uh, shipyard um facilities uh, so they they can they can make these military ships uh, as quickly as possible in a large quantities, which is going to be critical for warfare around in in that region, just because um, it's more the war for the for the islands, because most of these places like Philippines, Taiwan, Japan, for the most part they are islands. Um, that's where the whole conflict is going to be happening at least at the first phase where it's gonna sort of move remains to be seen and including hawaii because that's gonna be if things gonna go um in a bad way for the u.s hawaii gonna get hit uh by by the chinese and you know they can get the same as what ha was happening basically with japan they can go as far as uh, australia um you know and, and all that so uh, going back, so Ch China is gaining this uh, diplomatic uh, uh, leverage and uh, energy leverage. And what they now offering to Saudi Arabia is to start trading in yuan, uh, Chinese currency. Mm. And the an initial step is 50-50. And unlike Russia in India, where it doesn't work, this is actually uh, potentially can work because um, Saudi Arabia is supplying about like 50, 57 billion, uh, so crude oil worth of 57 billion uh, US dollars per year and buying 30 billion worth of goods from China. So there is mutual sort of interest. There is something that Saudi Arabia obviously wants in China 
and then China wants uh, crude oil. So there is uh, something that they can exchange. It's in a way kind of like almost like a barter. Um, that's the reason why it's happening because really Saudi Arabia is not interested in holding uh, Chinese yuan. Um, they totally understand it's not real currency, just uh, totally controlled by the Chinese um, you know, government, uh, by the Communist Party. So uh, you cannot trust that. But, you know, as, as a medium of exchange, it, it works, right? It's a first step. Um, in, in the long run, this is not going to work for China just because there is no trust component there. Unless U.S. destroys completely trust in its own currency, which is a real possibility. Uh, but, um, but until that happens, uh, all attempts by China to sort of take over um, reserve currency status uh, will probably fail, <laughs> which is going to be key actually for for even winning in this war because it's not just military conflict it's a conflict in in all aspects it's economic financial cultural um you know and military conflict so it's it go it's happening in all sort of aspects of life and you really need to win in all aspects of life to really win in this war um so this is um what's happening with China, then uh, India, uh, India is actually buying, uh, increasing consumption of uh, crude oil uh, to 4.8 uh, uh, million barrels per day, which um, kind of tells us that uh, A, it helps to spur a local economy because of cheap, uh, cheap energy, uh, B, it's exporting to the U.S. and to Europe, Russian, um, you know, they process Russian crude and then they export products, processed products, you can get diesel, gasoline, jet fuel, all of that's like gas oil, all of that goes to Europe uh, and U.S. So, you know, India is definitely winning in this whole situation. Um, this is probably, I would say, the only winner out of this whole, um, on the, how this whole sanctions war. Um, now, um, I actually would like to mention, talk a little bit about the uh, financial situation in the U.S. because it is, um, say, uh, everybody's sort of concerned about it and probably on everyone's uh, uh, mind is... Uh, probably everybody knows that uh, Silicon Valley Bank um, went bankrupt and was taken over by FDIC in the U.S. on Friday. Um, it has about like 211 um, billion worth of assets. Then there is another bank that went under, uh, Signature Bank. Uh, this one is I think, in New York. Um, so this this happened actually. On the 12th, on Sunday, also taking over. This is a uh, half size of the uh, of their uh, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, about 100, uh, 100 billion in assets. So in total, you, you get like 311 at least. Um, the Silicon Valley uh, Bank is the 18th in size in the US. So if you combine both, it's definitely, you know, you're shooting towards probably, I don't know, 15, 16, 14 place in, in the U.S. So this is already not a, not a, not a pocket change. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of speculation and attempts to use uh, this, this situation to sort of advance all sort of agendas uh, by different various parties. Um, but there, and, and even like blame uh, depositors that they created the bank run and they are to blame so whenever you hear this uh, sort of emotional accusations of someone you just this is a first sign that this is sort of distraction and the real situation is something else and uh, requires actually digging into it so the reality is that um, so depositors are never at fault it actually mistakes that's being made 
by either bank management or systemic uh, um, how to say agency which is Federal Reserve that that's what really leads to these problems and uh, when the depositors go and want to get their money it's just the realization of the problems at this point this is they just basically like pull the curtain and see that there is something that their money is miss, missing and that's what they that's that's so that's not their fault the the reason the money is missing is not be, you know it's not because of the depositors it's not uh, uh their fault as i said um the reason uh it's um uh, it went bankrupt is because the interest rates uh in the us rose very quickly right so um um so just we will take and we will take some specific example and i'm sorry if i'm overloading some people with sort of financial uh investing terms but uh if you look at them um assets the, the way bank operates it gets money from depositors and this is called liabilities uh, and then what it does it turns around and you know invests that money and the investing happens in many ways it gives loans to someone to acquire some real estate for the most part things like that uh, and then it also you know invests money um by let's say giving money uh, borrowing money to the government to the u.s government uh, and all municipalities or again uh, u.s government agencies that essentially control uh real estate mortgage market uh, in the u.s because it's essentially uh <coughs> government run market in many ways it's there's it's not a really free market in the u.s uh, and so that's what they did uh, they took money from the depositors and the, for the most part in the nature of these depositors uh, and this is very important uh, it's mostly startups right from almost as it says silicon wallace all right so startups uh, they had a lot of money they deposited that money the bank turned around wants to earn sort of something that's how they earn they turn around and invest that money on behalf of the depositors and they just earn the difference between what they pay to depositors versus what they earn from those investments so this is the difference they this is their profit that's why they work and uh, so what they did so as I said they invested all of this money into um, basically mortgage backs it's when I say mortgage backed securities, what this really means is they borrow, uh, they lend, I guess they lend money to uh, government agencies that essentially control mortgage market in the US and they in turn lend and uh, uh, they, they, they give money to the borrowers so they can buy homes, whatever, commercial or real estate and so on. Uh, so that's what they did. And some rest of it, they were invested in. Uh, they, they basically lent money to the US government in various shapes and forms so uh, the uh, the sort of how to say universal measure of exposure of risk for all of this investment that they made uh, it's called duration it's not a perfect but it's um, uh, it's called duration and duration there was uh, for this whole assets of this bank is 5.6 years and so what this means duration it's actually also very crude it's kind of like a crude approximation of the risk so what this really means is it shows uh by how much um, um value of these assets will go down if interest rate rate goes up by one percent so if interest rate goes up by one percent the value goes down by 5.6 percent so uh and duration is 5.6 years what this really means we can actually like so kind of like we need to know how, so because interest rates went up over past year tremendously uh all over the world and in particular in us but let's just look by how much they they rose in the 
easiest approximation is uh, five-year treasuries, which is uh, the basically uh, U.S. government borrowing for five years from you know investors in the world. That went up from one percent to roughly four percent. Just for the simplicity, let's so the uh, it went up by essentially three percent, right? Uh, three by five is around 15 percent so the value of the securities of the investments that this bank has went down by 15 percent right so what this does it first um, they have buffer which called equity the the basic owners of the bank right they they have equity they own equity in the um in the bank so that buffer and will get got wiped out first because they lost 15 percent and it's roughly uh a sink out of that portfolio roughly 130 uh billion was invested in all of this um basically that instruments uh so that's i don't know how many roughly let's say 20 billion and equity there was roughly 15 or 16 billion so all of that equity was wiped out so the owners of the bank all um not owners of the bank anymore <laughs> because it, that's why it's when it went bankrupt so they don't have anything they don't own anything in this bank they become bankrupt all of this equity owners of the bank um by the way i think i saw that the, one of the swedish large swedish uh pension fund had a huge exposure um to Silicon Valley Bank, and I'll mention there are a couple more of the same business model, which also significantly impacted. So the exposure there is pretty big, actually, uh, for that Swedish uh, pension fund. Um, so, anyways, so the the all of those um, equity owner, the the owners of the bank, when you know no longer the owners of the bank, so. Uh, but this losses started eating out into the money of this uh, depositors, right? So whatever we assume, three billion out of I don't remember what's the number there, but basically three billion out of the um, I think depositors where they had about let's say assume it's hundred ninety billion dollars, so they lost three billion dollars, right? And so they started eating out into the money that's uh, depositors money which is general public and as I said it's mostly startups um, and here's another sort of layer in a way sort of perfect storm why it started happening is because in the world of startups there was a plenty of money until when the interest rates were extremely low because venture capital capitalists and, and stock market were willing to fund all of the risky investments which is you know, startups are extremely risky, the riskiest of the riskiest, right? So they were willing to give the money because the interest rate was extremely low, close to zero. Uh, interest rate went up over the past year significantly. So all of that funding to startups dried up. So the venture capitalists don't, don't want to give money anymore to the uh, startups. They cannot raise money. Uh, on a stock exchange, like they cannot do IPOs because nobody wants to do at the high valuation that they charge. Otherwise, they they also essentially those startups are bankrupt. So there, the startups starting from probably middle of last year, 2022, uh, they the the sources of their funding dry, uh, dries up, and because it's a startup, right? They not sell sufficient. They rely on this piles of money that they get from VCs to leave because many of them don't have uh, revenues or revenues are extremely small relative to their expenses. So they are sort of cash burning, how to say, furnaces. And temporarily they had those huge piles of money and they put, they parked that those huge uh, piles of money in terms of, you know, in deposits in the shape of, in the form of deposits at Silicon Valley Bank, right? And, you know, at that time they didn't need it, but now the funding stopped. So they, the only way for them to survive <laughs> before they get enough revenue from their 
hopefully customers, is to rely on the spells of money that they got in the past from VCs and so on. And so they start, you know, burning um, through that cash and they started withdrawing their deposits uh, from SVB, not because they decided to do a rain, run on the bank or whatever. It's because naturally, because they don't gen generate any revenue, they need money to basically continue their operations and hopefully get to the revenue stage. And they don't get any money because interest rates went up significantly. So the only way to uh, <clears throat> for them to survive is to use these deposits. And they started you know, draining it which is sort of it's like your savings account right you don't have any income <clears throat> but you have savings account and you live off the savings account uh, while you you finding a way to generate income the same with the startups it's exactly the same situation and so they um they naturally started withdrawing this uh, money and you know because the bank you know didn't have that money they were invested already in this long well uh in the not long term uh but basically in the that instruments that uh on average their maturity is 5.6 years uh as i said it's duration so it's 5.6 years so the bank cannot really get that money right away or if it can it will be with the loss as i said was uh <clears throat> roughly 15 percent maybe 16 percent 17 percent if you you know three three percent up multiply by 5.6 whatever the number is uh <clears throat> so i think it's actually 18 percent so let's say it's 18 percent um so if bank goes and tries to get uh sell those that instruments they're gonna lose 18 percent and as i said uh that wiped out their equity completely obviously and starts eating into deposit and so this whole uh situation exploded um uh, but the, but again this is not because some bad depositors they decided to do some kind of bank run or whatever it's all in a way this whole story about bank run is kind of like one big lie an attempt to shift uh responsibility from actually mm, you know the Federal Reserve and the bank um, management to actually depositors to 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 all of the startups, which is ridiculous uh, because they could not collude or anything. This is like uh, there are many of them; they don't even know each other, and so on. So, anyways, uh, this is a result, as you can see, of rising interest rates, and they're rising really quick, and most banks they they in similar position to this one to svb the only uh, reason svb blew up first is because it's a weakest link and the weakest link is because it has its customer base was all of the startups that themselves are burning cash and they need cash and so they needed to withdraw their deposits just because they need to fund their operations and so uh you know as long as bank um you know depositors don't need to get that cash they can sort of get by and so uh again the situation remains to be seen where it's all going uh the problem is that now this whole situation become very public everybody's paying attention everybody's sort of scared so this actually can kind of create this as uh, you know people companies withdrawing uh, their cash out of scare so that's where the psychological situation starts to play out um, and so this can lead to sort of more bigger systemic uh, events but at the same time uh, looks like uh, the Department of Treasury FDIC Federal Reserve all of them looks like they're ready to bail out depositors um which is um basically they let the bank fail so the equity owners are gonna uh, get wiped out and go bankrupt and no, no longer owners of the bank which is i would say fair because they didn't manage bank right 
Um, and but then they they try to sort of limit the damage only to uh, <clears throat> to the bank owners and not sort of the so the depositors are not going to get hurt. So they they're going to make them sort of whole. Apparently, it looks like they're bailing out these depositors, um, which they they obviously uh, you know they 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 basically collateral damage in this whole situation because the whole situation is coming from uh, interest rates rates uh, rising extremely sharply over the year as I said so as you can see for five year treasury it went from one percent to four percent so right so this is the banks uh, cannot deal with that um, with the interest rates rising that fast let's put it this way and that's creating problems for them um, because what happens is if you really think about it the interest uh, the depositors that they have they they you know the banks pay them let's say two percent right on their deposits right now um, they can go and invest in the u.s government debt directly actually uh, and get five percent for short term um, short duration short, short term government debt like i think like six months or nine months nine months or one year and you get five percent or even more i think like 5.5 something like that so why why to keep it at the bank if you can get more and significantly more uh, uh from the u.s government and so there there is that sort of part that's incentive and so you're losing depositor base, basically money from the depositors. At the same time, you lend, you basically invested this money also at low interest rates because you were, you know, the interest rates a year ago were very low. So you were giving loans at low interest rates, let's say it's 3%, right? So you cannot, so the, your difference was you were, you were lending to whoever at 3%. You were paying two percent or even less, one point five, one percent at that time uh, to your depositors. So three minus, let's say one, two percent. This is your sort of. This is how you live. Um, so that's your income, and that you know that's your revenue. And so all of that now is completely destroyed because you know you lent, and it's you know you you gave a loan for in this case, let's say five point six years. Uh, you can let's say five years right so you cannot just pull the loan from whoever you landed as a bank and it's still it's going to pay for five years that's three percent but your depositors they don't want that three percent and they don't want even two percent they want five or five point five you, you cannot simply pay them five point five right so so you have this problem where depositors they basically going to be pulling money from the from the from the banking system because there is no point you can go and and and, and lend and money to the to the u.s government and so this is where the systemic problem is is all of this with the rising interest rates because you know bank lend to many borrowers at extremely low interest rates uh and they become actually like cash flow negative right away mm. <laughs> if the uh, the depositors demand uh, more money higher interest rates which they can because the alternative is the u.s government so you cannot resolve this whole situation without actually dropping interest rates uh, and that by that i mean federal reserve so right now i think it's 4.75 to 5 percent i believe if i'm correct and they were supposed to meet in like 10 days or so to increase again and to do another increase which is probably not going to happen but so they are in difficult situation on one hand um you need to drop interest rates um, because the whole banking system is essentially becoming insolvent and the more you raise the interest rates the more insolvent it becomes and more quicker the collapse can, can happen so they they cannot that so this is sort of one side of sort of equation and the other one is you have in high inflation which destroys society by different means 
And for that to control that inflation, you need to increase interest rates. So it's like it's there in a situation where no matter what you do, the situa- the, the outcome is going to be very bad. And which path they, they, they choose, who knows. But the end sort of destination is the same. It's just different roads that lead to the same end destination. Um, whether you choose to continue fighting inflation uh, or you choose to drop interest rates to save the banking system, this is two alternatives. And, you know, if you really think kind of like cynically, Federal Reserve is designed to protect the banking system, not the society. Dominantly, um, legally, they are tasked with, I think, maintaining maximum employment and something and, and growth in society or something like that economic growth uh, but the reality is that by nature they are there to protect the banks the banking system so it remains to be seen because they're going to have also huge public pressure not to save banks but continue fighting inflation or will remains to be seen how like they will have a lot of political pressure let's put this way uh, on them and how this going to play out uh, nobody knows um but as I said, neither road is going to be happy road and will lead to, uh, let's say, significant economic restructuring in the West as a whole. And, and part of the reason for all of this happening is, again, all of this um, war on you know, energy, uh, conventional energy, and generally on resource on, um, let's say, commodity production and just generally uh, industrial production and so on. This is the outcome of all of that. It just comes through, you know, seemingly unrelated way. But this is this is the outcome of all of that. Uh, <clears throat> and, and also desire to sort of continue as if nothing happened, as if you have unlimited resources and, and you can afford you know, use alternative energy as opposed to conventional energy, which most of the West, they can, they cannot, with exception of few countries. Uh, or they will go back to the, let's say, medieval ages if they try to do that. And so this is the situation. This is a very combustive situation where um, politically there will be a lot of blaming, you know, this side blames that side, but they're not going to be really try to find a solution to it, like real solution. They will be trying to find like, you know, the, try to pull the sort of um, blanket on themselves by sort of making other side more naked. And this is where where the political system is really dysfunctional and not really designed to solve this kind of problems, even though it is, it has created this, this problem in the first place, because all these problems are coming from a political system. So in a way, Federal Reserve itself is a hostage of this whole problems generated by political system uh and and but they the, the irony of this that they might be might get blamed for all of that which was done by political system so this is this is significance of this whole situation is not so much about this svb or this another one signature bank um this is all about this whole big huge problem and it looks like this ability to push the problem down the road uh, is over uh, in the West, and you know, obviously, U.S. is sort of the leader of the West, so you know they hit the, that wall first. But something similar might be happening, you know, in Europe, ev- everywhere in the West, and even I don't know, probably in Japan, because they also be, they've been doing this for a long time. Um, you know, probably nobody will be spared as a result of all of this. Uh, well, in, in Ukraine also will not be spared because the funding for Ukraine, once that there are financial difficulties, extreme financial difficulties in the West, in the US, this desire to fund Ukraine is going to go down even much, much, much further than it, than, than it is right now. It's already sort of waning, but the desire, you know, as I said, this is going to get much, much, much worse. So... We'll see what happens. Uh, Ukraine sort of for now has time till, let's say, end of the summer. What happens then, we'll see. 
nobody knows. But at the same time, Russia is also suffering financially, mightily, and which shape and form they will be financially is also another question. Um, there is basically there is a uh, the situation where both sides have well to fight they 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 not going to back out the only way they're going to back out because they will they will basically drop that because they they don't get resources that they need like you know artillery shells or uh, financial resources or people <clears throat> those are main sort of three uh three items in this equation um so we'll see what happens uh, nothing as i said predetermined um, so the only problem is on, U on the Ukrainian side is extremely corrupt and incompetent top, both political and military that does not know how to win this war, let's put it this way. <clears throat> now let's actually walk through the front line um, uh, in a clockwise fashion, starting from the very north and then you know, going down south and, well, I guess a little bit west. Uh, so the situation along the state border uh, remains intense. There is exchange of artillery fire. Uh, it's not as intense as it used to be, but definitely not sort of on the low end either. Now let's jump to the North Luhansk front line. Things here are more or less the same. Russian side continues their uh, attacks in this large forest from this Dibrova village. Uh, trying to clear up this whole corner between the two rivers. This is Siversky Donetsk. This one I don't even remember, some small stream. Um, there were no new attacks against these bridgeheads here, uh, but I'm sure in you know in a day or two there will be new attacks there. So far, uh, Ukrainian defenses are holding on. Um, how long this is going to happen, nobody knows, but so far this is sort of more of the like area of the front line where things are more under control. Let's put it this way. Uh, now let's look at North Donbass front line where the things are really, really bad for Ukraine. Um, and however, we'll actually, I, I have a camera out here. So the Russian resources reporting that, uh, and this is partially confirmed by Ukrainian, is that um, uh, Russian troops or Wagner mercenaries uh, managed to get into Oriho Vasilivka, this village. So they control at least uh, eastern part of it. And potentially by now they controlling most of it and Ukrainian troops just on the western outskirts of it. And that they are also approaching this village Minkivka here. So <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't sort of change the map for now because I don't have, let's say, extremely high probability confirmation but it looks very likely so this whole area has been captured don't know situation about the Lizniansky potentially also captured because uh, for them to for Wagner mercenaries to be sort of to continue this attacks in a safe way they need to um, how to say cover their flanks and because otherwise it's very extremely narrow corridor that could be easily cut off and they fully aware of that so uh, there's a chance that Izdansky also has been lost, but I don't have good confirmation at this point. Um, so probably tomorrow I'll have more, but there's definitely some progress here. It's just, it's just unclear to what extent, basically. Um, so this is uh, the uh, what's going on here on the northern flank of Bakhmut. Uh, then uh, let's actually go like this area so far, somewhat more or less stable around Chromova. So what I'm talking about, this area is more or less stable, starting from this artificial lake south and then towards east, uh, where the Russian troops are making advances. There is this um, um, non-fares, uh, uh, metals uh, processing plan. Basically, this is like a recycling metal smelter. So something I mentioned before, like a spira, uh, in in uh, GmbH in Germany that was actually shut down. This is basically equivalent of that uh, plant. They were like smelting like aluminium and so on and other non-ferrous metals out of the scrap uh, <clears throat> that they would get here. So there's, uh, and it's a big facility here. So uh, Wagner Center is starting an attack there. They are storming this 
this factory or smelter, whatever you call it. So basically, they're coming much closer to squeezing Ukrainian troops out of Bakhmut. So basically, they <clears throat> the tactic at this point is actually more towards squeezing Ukrainian troops from Bakhmut as opposed to trying to do encirclement. The part of the reason for that is because southern flank is pretty good shape on the Ukrainian side. And let's just go back. Let's actually go um, uh, this map. The, so the southern flank is covered by the 3rd Brigade and 93rd, which are one of the better ones in Ukrainian uh, army. Um, there are many more motivated soldiers and so on. That, as I said in the past, unfortunately, being uh, used up uh, in a bad way where they plug with their bodies the, the front line, which is very wrong because eventually this will run out either. So, like, you know, let's say the 53rd, 57th Brigade would just retreat without a question, and, you know, others as well, 46, 60, or 61st. Uh, they would definitely would not hold the front line the same way. But so far, this stabilized the southern flank. And so <laughs> Wagner Mercedes cannot advance here. So the only sort of way for them is to continue advancing here in the north. Um, but advances there are also not terribly fast and so on. And then <laughs> they also had now 67th Brigade, which is also on the better side. Uh, and... So Ukrainian command somewhat stabilized this northern flank. Not fully, because you, as you can see, there are still advances here where the weaker brigades are. But this one, sort of the, to close the bottleneck, to extent, is stable. So, um, and then if we switch to, to the Russian side, Wagner Mercenary is also exhausted. They sort of doing like this last hurrah. And they really just want to score the goal and get out, basically. That's just their motivation. So they seeing this whole difficulty with the southern flank. And then there is much more problems now on the northern. So they try simply at this point squeeze out Ukrainian troops from Bakhmut. Which is much worse strategy because it leads to many more losses on the Russian side. Uh, and then they try to continue pushing here in this north uh, western direction um, but uh, they also very concerned at this point uh, this is what they also say that there is significant reserves uh, accumulated by Ukrainian command in around Chesivyar around here and they concerned that they can hit <coughs> Wagner mercenaries in the in the flank which is, doesn't make sense from here because you would really need attacks somewhere from here or from here anyway so <clears throat> basically there's enough resources in ukrainian side where they will not allow this um, bottleneck to be closed by wagner mercenaries and they probably real starting to realize that so they switching to squeezing ukrainian troops out and that's actually uh it's very um expensive strategy but at the same time um, it's a viable strategy because um, the ability to, to resupply troops in the core of the town are extremely bad. You know, they essentially being slowly suffocated. Uh, they don't have enough oxygen. So they are on the losing side. Ukrainian troops here, they, not, they, don't, they don't get a resupply the way they should. Uh, and so just because of that, it helps... Uh, Wagner mercenaries to squeeze Ukrainian troops. And so there is high chance that that's going to happen, that they uh, will manage to capture Bakhmut by slowly squeezing out Ukrainian troops. And there is a chance that they will stop somewhere around this chrome of a front line. A front line sort of stabilizes somewhere here. <coughs> they claim the victory politically. The head of Wagner mercenaries sort of says, okay, you see, I'm a victor, you know, I, I can demand more in, in Russia, in the Russian uh, power system. And so, and then he just leaves and he leaves all of the problems for the regular Russian army to deal with here. Um, because all they did, they would squeeze. Then there's still significant Ukrainian force here that will try to do some kind of counteroffensive. I don't know if it's going to be successful because I said I have a big reservations about the 
um, Ukrainian command and specifically inability to coordinate, to train uh, troops and everything. So they are extremely incompetent. So even though there is, based on Russian resources, uh, there is uh, significant reserves here accumulated, um, the ability to use them effectively and efficiently uh, is big question. But they still will manage to do some damage, let's put this way. So, uh, and especially if it's going to be Russian regular army that can actually can be fa- fatal for the Russian regular army. That would not be probably fatal for the Wagner mercenaries, but for the Russian regular army that definitely could. There is high probability of that, let's put this way. Um, so anyway, so the situation here is very sort of <clears throat> complex, I would say. That's the best explanation of all of this. The outcome is uh, Wagner mercenaries switch to squeezing out Ukrainian troops probably will be successful and that uh, also probably means that they will sustain much higher losses that they could have otherwise uh, and that really also means that they're going to be extremely drained, extremely exhausted once they finish that but they want to do it so that because for them it means like they can get out from the front line. So this is like you're like okay you need to to get out, you need to accomplish this task, and so this is probably strong incentive to to complete that. And as I said, on the on the sort of positive for the Russian side is that resupply of Ukrainian troops is essentially significantly severed, and so they don't have enough of ammunition and everything, and so that forces the hand of Ukrainian uh, defenders and soldiers on the ground. So this is a situation here. What happens next is remains is is really a big question for the both sides. Uh, I mentioned before that Russia now is trying to form sort of new, um, refresh the army, sort of like new blood, four hundred thousand soldiers. Uh, they start they will start forming that in April. They they claim. So apparently, all of this three hundred, or at least what they say, has been sort of used up, or we'll see. Um, or at least there's not enough of their, um, you know, uh, thrust capacity left out of this 300,000 um, to the point that, okay, they being sort of replaced the losses more or less. And you have some extra, but it, it's definitely not enough for um, for major offensive. So this is, you know, to extend speculation. Over, I mean, everything you can say, all the speculation. But I would say it's educated speculation. Um, so basically, looks like all of those conscripts that they got, 300,000, were just essentially used up to plug the holes and beef up troops. But there's no significant uh, advantage over Ukrainian side yet still. So they need to kind of resort for the second wave <coughs> of basic conscription. Except this time... They trying to pay money so people, you know, sign contracts voluntarily, which I don't think you know they will get enough. They will get for they will not get four hundred thousand, but who knows? Uh, don't know enough the internal situation in uh, Russia. Oh, and by the way, on this topic, I actually forgot to put the um, uh, very interesting polling uh, that was done in Russia about like how do you see different countries as enemy or the friend. Uh, so the polling showed, and obviously you can take it with a grain of salt that you can say it's all made up and who knows, maybe it is, but I just want to share. So that showed that, uh, about like towards India and China, only 5% of Russians are, see them as enemies and the rest see them as sort of friends. I think there was like, uh, 11% 11% undecided in both cases, but as you can imagine, significant, overwhelming majority thinks uh, of the both India and uh, China as friends. But the interesting part where would be probably, um, I guess, surprising, surprising for the Western audience, but not surprising for Ukraine or anyone who lived in the Soviet Union for that matter. Uh, <clears throat> so there was also Ukraine and the U.S., so uh, the number of Russians that's, that view U.S. as an enemy is actually larger than the number of Russians who view Ukraine as an enemy. 
uh, the, the difference is not terribly huge. It's like probably like three or four percent. But basically it was like 80 percent of Russians view um, U.S. as enemy, as a mortal enemy. And then 70, like something like 75 or 76 percent of Russians view Ukraine as an enemy. So uh, hopefully that really helps to explain that the, the for Russia, this is war with the U.S. and the enemy is not Ukraine. The enemy is U.S. and that's a sort of how to say prize. This is where they really aim at. Uh, this is was the aim of the Soviet Union, uh, and it remains the aim of Russia, not Ukraine. Ukraine is needed just as uh, more resources to attack U.S. Let's put this way. That's how this you know Russia views Ukraine essentially. Uh, now let's keep moving. Uh, let's uh, go to the central Donbass front line. Here, um, actually, there are some. There is some progress by Russian troops here, which is very unusual for regular Russian troops. They um, didn't show it because it's so small, but they managed to actually. You see, there is a road here that goes like this. So this is this curve of the road. They actually managed to just get over the curve of this road in this small section of it, but it actually materially makes a little bit situation or well, not let's say materially worse for ukrainians uh defenders in avdivka because it is it starts to form similar situation to bakhmut but it's it's still far away from that uh and it's still much more fixable it's the situation here is much more controllable but uh this is definitely development in the negative side for for ukrainian defenders here let's put this way uh, this uh, this move here. Uh, otherwise, Marinka, the same situation, status quo. Russian troops continue attacks uh, without much success, and the same is true in Vugladar, which they continue attack with, uh, let's say, uh, ne <laughs> call it this way, negative success for the Russian side. Um, now let's uh, quickly finish with the Zaporizhia front line. Things here are quiet. Uh, in terms of active action here. Uh, remains to be seen if this is going to remain um, sort of active uh, section of the front line. There was high expectation that there will be some really major action, major offensive here, but it looks like the whole resources were pulled uh, up north to uh, northern bus front line, and so neither side has resources to do anything here at this point. This is the best explanation of what's going on here. Uh, that's it for today. Thanks uh, for watching and listening. Until next time, bye-bye.